So in this last module for week three, I just want to give some parting tips about repetition, keywords, and acronyms. Some of these things I've alluded to already, uh, but they're worth repeating. Um, and so I've, as we've been going along in some of the modules, I've noted a couple of times something about repetition. So I've pointed out to you a few times where I think the authors, you know, had used a word once and then they found themselves using the same word either within the same sentence or maybe a, a sentence nearby and they reached either in their brain or you know an actual thesaurus they reached for a synonym to give a different um, word there to replace that word with a synonym because they didn't want to repeat the word and so I think a lot of us have you know after years of being told not to repeat words, somehow, somehow we've got it ingrained that we're never supposed to repeat a word too close to uh, having used the word before. And so this is something that uh, you know everybody kind of does. We find ourselves reaching for the thesaurus. So as I've alluded to before, there's a couple of things I want you to do when you find yourself uh, reaching for the thesaurus to avoid using that word twice or you know multiple times. So the first question I want you to ask yourself is whether or not the second instance of the word is even necessary. And I've given you several examples where when you find yourself repeating the word it's actually just because you're being too repetitive and you don't really need to use the word at all. There doesn't, there's nothing is necessary. You can just delete it completely. So, um, so I gave you some examples two weeks ago. There was a sentence where the author had used challenges and then difficulties. And we didn't need challenges and difficulties in the same sentence. They were both, though those words were making the same point. And in that same sentence, the author used the verbs illustrate and demonstrate. And actually, we only needed one of those verbs because we could use illustrate or demonstrate for both solutions and challenges. So we could drop one of those verbs altogether. Uh, in an earlier module this week, I gave you an example where in the first sentence, the author wrote, evidence-based medicine teaches clinicians. And then in the second sentence, they started the next sentence, it guides clinicians. So they had to use an it. They replaced evidence-based medicine with an it. And then they reached for the thesaurus to find another word that wasn't teaches, but was like teaches, and they found guides. So that was another instance where actually we didn't need two sentences there, and so we ended up deleting uh, one of those sentences and deleting the word guides and just leaving in teaches. So a lot of times when you find yourself reaching for the second instance of that word, it's actually not even necessary. It's telling that you need to that you need to delete something. Um, but of course, there are some times when the word is actually needed. And then you may be tempted to say, well, okay, I've, I've gone through, I've vetted it, and I know I do need to refer to this word again. It's not just repetition. Um, but I, I still feel like I don't want to say the same word twice, so you're reaching for that synonym. Ask yourself the question then is if the word is really needed, is a synonym actually better than just repeating the word? And so you can get into a lot of trouble, and I'm going to show you some amusing examples, uh, when you try too hard to replace a word with a synonym. Sometimes it's actually better to just repeat the same word, and it's okay to repeat a word sometimes. Now this is especially important for scientific uh, literature, for scientific manuscripts, because sometimes it's absolutely essential that you repeat exactly the same word as is every time you use it in the manuscript, which may mean that it's repeated frequently within you know, a close distance. So uh, these are things like when you're naming the comparison groups in your study, when you're naming the variables or naming the instruments you used. I even see with, um, with my students that they are tempted to even change out those words, so those keywords, and that can lead to all sorts of trouble, right? So uh, I've had uh, students come in and, you know, they're working on a particular disease. Well then, you know, they, there's two words for the same disease, and they, in one instance they use the, the one word, in another instance they use the other word, and of course, uh, I don't know that those are exactly the same disease, so I think, well, maybe those are slightly different uh, takes on the same disease, right? It gets the reader confused. Or, you know, imagine if you're calling, you're comparing groups, and you've got like an obese group and a lean group. And in one case, you call it the obese group versus the lean group, but then later on, you say, well, I already used those terms, so I'm going to call it the heavier group versus the lighter group. Well, that's problematic, because now, as the reader, I'm going to myself, Oh, is that a new group? Have you redefined the groups? Have you rejiggered the categories? You know, I think that you're talking about a whole different group. So it's absolutely essential in scientific writing that you be consistent in how you name those keywords. So again, I just want to repeat, <laughs> I want to repeat to you that it's okay to repeat a word. Sometimes it's necessary to repeat a word, and sometimes it's actually better to repeat that word than to reach for the, uh, the awkward synonym. 
And uh, there's some fun examples uh, that I just have to share with you about needless synonyms. So this is instances where professional writers, these are all um, examples that came from like, newspaper and magazine articles, they kind of had this, oh, I can't repeat a word, you know, uh, drilled into them. And so they went to find a synonym to uh, simple words and came up with these kind of very amusing uh, synonyms. So I have to share some of these with you. These examples, by the way, were compiled in an article in Time, and I have the reference down there if you want to read further and find some more of these examples. Probably the most famous example of this is uh, there was an article that somebody was writing about a fruit company. And uh, they used the word banana several times because, of course, yeah, you know, not surprisingly, since it was an article about fruit. And they felt like, oh, I've used the, the, the word banana too many times. And so at one point, you know, three or four bananas into the piece, they started referring to the banana as the elongated yellow fruit. And you can see that that's just kind of ridiculous. It's probably just better to say banana. I've got several other cute examples of this. So there was a piece in a, in a newspaper where... Uh, the author was talking about a beaver, and the author replaced beaver on a you know a second or third reference with the furry paddle-tailed mammal. Uh, another article, mustache was replaced with undernose hair crops. Um, another article, milk from a cow was referred to as the vitamin-laden liquid from a bovine milk factory. So you can see these are just you know they're really funny because it's, they're, the author's just trying too hard. Just go with the simple word. And then uh, finally, uh, there was an example where somebody replaced the word skis, and they've used skis already, so they, they didn't want to repeat, so they replaced skis with the beatified barrel staves. So you can see how uh, quite amusing it is when you're trying too hard uh, to come up with synonyms. It would have been better just in all those cases to stick with the simple word. Um, and if you want to read more about this, uh, there's that Time article that I uh, have on the, the earlier slide, and then um, Henry Fowler uh, actually coined the uh, term elegant variation for this kind of um, needless synonyms. So he came up with this term of, of people trying too hard to come up with a, a synonym rather than just using the simple word uh, to avoid repetition. Uh, and so if you want to read his whole, whole article on elegant variation, the link is there for those of you who are curious. And I just want to, you know, emphasize again that, you know, I'm giving you some examples that are a little amusing or inelegant um, in, you know, magazine articles. And it, but, you know, elongated yellow fruit, everybody's going to understand your meaning. It's even more disastrous, not just needless, it's kind of sometimes disastrous in scientific writing to substitute a keyword with a synonym. So again, the reader, if you, if you start switching around the names of your groups, the names of variables, to, just to avoid repetition, your reader is actually going to think that you're referring to different groups, different variables, models, instruments. And so it's really disastrous. And I've, I've reviewed many, many papers where this has been a major problem because I actually thought that the authors were, you know, talking about two different groups or talking about two different variables, and I didn't realize that they were actually talk referring to the same thing. But they changed their words, uh, probably to avoid repetition. So you don't need to avoid repetition. Uh, so it's not, it's, it's actually okay and preferable in many cases to repeat a word, especially a keyword. And this leads to a final thought on acronyms, uh, which I've mentioned uh, in an earlier module, but it is worth repeating. Um, again, it's okay to repeat words, and I, and I think one of the reasons that acronyms have become so um, just widespread in the scientific literature is simply that I think when authors are writing, uh, you know, they're writing the same keyword over and over again. It's not, that, it's not only that they get a little lazy and don't want to keep typing it out. I think that they have this thought, oh, I can't repeat a word, and they feel this, you know, angst about the fact that they're repeating this keyword so many times. So then they fall into the trap of making an acronym to avoid repeating it. Well, it would be better, again, just to write out the key word than to just make up uh, acronyms all over the place. As I talked about in an earlier module, we had the example uh, where an author had abbreviated microRNA, which of course is itself already an acronym, with the acronym MIR. And I should point out that sometimes people make a distinction between acronyms and initialisms. Acronyms actually, you know, making a kind of a new word and initialisms just being the initials. I'm not going to, I just tend to refer them to them all as acronyms, but I'll point out that distinction. Um, so you can see that that's, that, you know, using MIR in this case, rather than microRNA was really unnecessary. It only saved a few letters, uh, and the author's, you know, the reader is not going to know what MIR is. It would have been easier for the reader if you just repeated microRNA. Uh, so again, I'm going to repeat myself and say to you, 
please only use very, very standard acronyms like RNA and DNA. And please don't make acronyms as you go along. Uh, make them up. You know, a lot of authors do this nowadays where they're writing along and oh, I have to just keep saying the same keyword. I'm just going to come up with an acronym. That's <clears throat> really, really, really hard on the reader. And I can't tell you how many papers I've been reviewing uh, where I've, you know, gotten lost in acronyms because there's just they're just so all over the place in, in manuscripts nowadays and it's not that easy to find the definition. So basically I have, as a reviewer have to stop or as a reader uh, say, oh, what was that acronym? Now I've got to search through the whole paper to try to find where they define that acronym. It's really distracting uh, and it makes the paper much, much harder to read. So I'm going to really encourage you to try to give up your acronyms except the ones that are absolutely the most standard. And if there's a few acronyms that you can't let go of and that you absolutely won't let go of, at least make sure that you define them in the abstract as well as within each table and figure as well as within the text. Because remember, readers are not necessarily reading all of those parts. And for long papers, I actually recommend that you redefine those acronyms occasionally in different parts of the paper because most readers don't typically sit down and read a paper from start to finish. So just because you have that acronym early on and defined it early on doesn't mean that's going to be easier for the reader to find that definition. So again, try to cut down on your use of acronyms and don't feel bad about repeating those keywords. It's better to repeat those keywords than to find ridiculous synonyms for them or to turn them into acronyms. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.